Yes, it is entirely possible the rest of the world looks at us broken car guys and gals as a group of mental patients because instead of something that screams look at me in a crazy shade of yellow, we prefer the form of a German station wagon blessed with an obscene amount of horsepower, so much so we drove two of the most recent ones, the Audi RS6 Avant and the Porsche Panamera Turbo SE Hybrid Sport Turismo. Now, being this is our jam and all, did you really think we were gonna drive the other two horsemen and not drive the one that has been on these shores the longest, and I will add, has been updated for 2021. If you've been watching the show for a while now, you should be able to rattle these numbers off with me. For the avoidance of doubt, that is not an E63, it is an E63S, because that is the only one on offer in the US. So 603 horsepower, that comes in at 5,750 RPM, stays flat all the way up to 6,500 RPM. And here's the good number, 627 pound-feet of torque comes in at 2,500 RPM, stays flat up to 4,500 RPM. Now something we did not cover in the E63S sedan episode, there is a cylinder deactivation mode with this engine. It kicks in at 1,000 RPM and goes all the way up to 3,250 RPM, obviously for use in low load situations. Now that drives all four wheels with one slight provision. This is one of the few high performance German sort of luxury mid-sized sedans where you can lop off the torque to the front wheels. We have done that trick in a couple of other episodes, so we're not gonna do it here because we have some other very important business to get to. That goes through a nine speed wet multi-plate clutch transmission for the avoidance of doubt, no torque converter. One other very important note here, this engine, it is hand built in this case. I can't really read this guy's name. I think it's Martin Yapa, Herr Yapa, if I am mispronouncing that, uh, Entschuldigung, but uh, vielen Dank for this engine. So yes, this is a station wagon, but do we really need to talk about fuel economy? Okay, you twisted my arm, 16, 18, 22. As a basis of comparison, that is a hair better than the RS6 we recently drove. And now to the business at hand, which are the performance figures. Uh, zero to 60, it's slightly handicapped over the sedan, 3.4 to 60, as opposed to 3.3. And VMAX, also slightly handicapped, that is 180 as opposed to 186. The opposite side of all that information, 4,669 pounds, or depending on how you express your weights and measures, 2,117 kilograms. That, as a refresher, is quite a bit lighter than the RS6 with that. Oh, oh Santa Maria! Madre de Dios. What's most amazing to me about the power delivery here, there is just no impact on acceleration and everything associated with acceleration, even considering the body style. That just blows my mind. So yes, it is true. I did want to drive this car because A, it's been updated, and B, now we have visibility into driving the updated Sport Turismo Turbo SE Hybrid and the RS6 that came out after this car. But the real reason I wanted to get the car here is I had the opportunity to talk to the product manager of the vehicle here in the US. His name is Brian. He is a proper car guy and has a proper classic car collection. So always a good guy to chat with. And he gave me a lot of insight into how this thing came to being, or really the changes. And it's all a function of the development of the GT four-door. Now, why do I say that? Mercedes-Benz, they don't really make it a secret that the AMG GT four-door is very much based on the underpinnings of an E-Class, even though it looks like a GT on the outside. That's where we have to get into a little history, because when this car came out back in, what, 2016, for the 2017 model year, the then future AMG GT four-door hadn't come out yet. It wouldn't come out for another two years. So all of the changes that the engineers were working on to the E-Class platform to make it a GT four-door hadn't made it to this car. And those changes are the following. Significant changes to the bushings. All of them throughout the car are significantly stiffer in a GT four-door. Then they change the coating 
of the air springs, then they changed the damper settings. That learning was picked up from the GT four-door, which now has been out, what, two, two and a half years, and they've even tweaked that, and so they take all those changes and have applied it to this car here. And then, believe it or not, they've made the wheels a bit more aerodynamic to complement the changes in the nose. That Pan Americana grille does improve the coefficient of drag ever so slightly. Now, all of that sits on top of the foundation we already know, which is the multi-link in the front, multi-link in the rear. And in this case, 15.4 inch diameter rotors in the front, 14.2 in the rear. Now, for the avoidance of doubt, the car you and I are driving is fitted with the optional carbon ceramic rotors. So the impact of all of that sadly is not in this full fat race mode as much as we want it to be. Rather, the most noticeable changes here are in an incredibly unlikely place, and that is the non-business end uh, comfort mode. Here, yeah, there's a lot more compliance, but what's happening is there's still composure, even pushing it aggressively. Granted, it's going to have more pitch here. It's going to have more dive, squat, all kind of stuff. Remember, there's six modes here. I think that's too many modes. It's not that they're trying to open this up to more people because they literally sell every one of them they build and probably could sell double. This is more about more usable scenarios for the freaks like you and I that would actually drive something like this every day. Instead, there is a much wider delta between race and comfort modes. But enough of this comfort mode, let's get back to the business end, which is race mode. And here, if I am looking into the crystal ball of trying to understand the differences in this mode, you'd need to take this car to a track and take the one that came before it, drive them back to back, because the differences are only gonna be way up here in the very high limits of adhesion. And this is a vehicle that frankly, it's got higher limits than most people who drive it have. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game of mine, the options game with today's contestant, one of the very few cars that I personally would write a check for, the 2021 Mercedes AMG E63 S wagon for a base price of $112,450. Now, if my memory serves me correctly, that is about six grand steeper than the last time we looked at it. Either way, we add arguably one of the best colors in all of the Mercedes world, probably one of the best colors on any car, that would be Brilliant Blue Magno. A couple things about this. Uh, number one, it is a matte blue and makes the car stand out. And number two, if Mercedes-Benz thinks that Kumo and I are giving this car back, they are sorely mistaken. Either way, it is an additional $3,950. And then surprisingly, that black and titanium Napa leather interior with the yellow piping and the contrast stitch, that is no charge. That surprises me. However, I do have a bone to pick with you. Why would you have a car that has this stunning color exterior and such a nice interior with black seatbelts? Why not yellow? Why not blue? Why not red? You need some contrast in there to pick up all the beautiful details in the interior. And granted, I probably wouldn't go with a black or gray interior, but at least you need the colored seat belts. Then while we're talking about dressing up the interior, the AMG carbon fiber package inside of the vehicle is an additional $2,850. Me, I would opt for a satin finish wood, which most likely would be cheaper. Then we add the carbon ceramic rotors for $8,950. Now in the Audi, I said, yeah, you need them in the Audi. Here, it's kind of a push. If you're tracking it, which I can't imagine someone would, you'd need it. Around town, I don't know if you need it. Then the 20 inch cross spoke with gray trim AMG wheels. These look absolutely stunning on the car. I think I like these better than the black wheels on the sedan that had the same color. Either way, they're $1,500. Then the multi-contour massage front seats, we will talk more about these later, $1,320. The head-up display, 
Why is this optional on a $112,000 car for an additional $1,100? Then we press on to an option I have never seen in a Mercedes AMG before, and that would be the dark tint grille. I don't know if I would spend $450 for it, but it's one of the cheaper options. Uh, to that, we add arguably one of the most important options, and I asked the same question, why is this optional on a $112,000 car? And that would be the Dinamica headliner. It's like the faux suede headliner. Very important for a car like this, $1,600. I would almost argue maybe a different contrast in color with the interior to really make it pop. And then the NBUX, that's the Hey Mercedes, the stuff they put commercials out about, yet they charge you an additional $200. I do not understand this. They do this in all the Mercedes. Uh, then the heated rear seats, this is a nice touch, $580. Then the AMG Performance Steering Wheel, the one we saw in the E63 sedan and we talked about it in that episode, you may wanna check that out. That is no charge. And then oddly, they give us some money back. They're handing us back $350 because this car does not have a heated steering wheel. My guess is they didn't have those parts in the factory the day this car was being built. Me personally, I would keep my receipt because I would want the heated steering wheel. Then we move into packages. The driver's assistance package. This is the Distronic Plus and all the safety doodads, $1,950. Then we press on to the exterior lighting package, which is the LED headlights and the high beam assist for $900. And of course, this wouldn't be around of the game with an AMG without the AMG night package, which is all the trim in black. Frankly, I would love to see one of these cars without the black trim just to see what it looks like and I would save $750. Then we add the acoustic glass package. This makes the inside quieter. I never understood this in an E63S wagon, but it is $1,100. Then the AMG Carbon Fiber Package 1. This is the splitter, the diffuser, and the inserts on the rocker panels, all carbon fiber for $1,750. And believe it or not, the only other thing we add on top of that is the destination and handling von Deutschland for $1,050 for a total suggested retail price of, I do not remember these cars being this expensive, $142,100. Now, I've kind of sandbagged in this episode thus far, all of the changes in the way this thing drives and driving dynamics, it's not just the changes we've discussed thus far, it's something that has been smack dab in front of your face the entire episode, and it's the front seats. Uh, you may remember the car we drove, what, three years ago, something like that? Uh, that had the Recaro-esque sports seats. Those, sadly, are no longer an option in this country. They can be had in Europe, but they cannot be had here. And if I may share some subjective feedback, to me, the personality of the vehicle has changed, as well as the ride quality. It feels more relaxed driving the car. I would want the different seats. I would want the ridiculous seats because let's be honest, one is buying this vehicle to be ridiculous. You want the stiffer seats that has less padding that puts you in a different driving position. These. They aren't bad, but it changes the character of the car. And I don't think this is anything technical I can say. The ride quality is different. The ride quality is probably the same. It's just the feel of the seats that has a huge impact on what I feel the ride quality is. And I think it would be different for each person who experiences these seats. Yes, it is always good to drive an E63 S wagon. Yet today was an unusually good experiment now that we've had the vantage point into the Audi and the Porsche. So driving this today confirmed a couple of things. First and foremost, it is not at all fair to compare this against the Panamera, especially the Turbo SE Hybrid, for two reasons. Number one, the Panamera, it's a longer vehicle, so it has a little bit of an advantage there. And number two, it has so much more power. Then there's the Audi. And I've spent a lot of time reflecting upon that car because man, oh man, do I miss it. But also now that I've had some wheel time again with this, and the personalities are entirely different, even though you would think they are the same equation, and it has everything to do with the engine placement. Me personally, I feel this car is sharper dynamically. But now that I've spent a good amount of time in the Audi, I can't say that one is worse, it's just different. And I feel the driving dynamics between the two are very, very subjective. Now, of course, we do have to get to the wish list here. And I really only have two things. Yeah, I would say a manual transmission, but you and I know that ain't happening in both cars, even though some of you commented about that in the Audi episode. 
But here, first and foremost, really, really, really need those sports seats back. It changes the personality of the car to the point where I would have a hard time buying the car with these seats. And then the second item on my wish list is a pretty big ask, and that would be integrating the 48 volt electrical system into this car. And I ask for a couple reasons. Now, first and foremost, I would be hard pressed to believe that they are not already on the development of doing this because it just makes natural sense where this will be the next progression of getting more efficient power out of this type of vehicle. But for me, it's not getting more power. For me, it's making the vehicle more reliable. And if we're being honest with one another, these types of vehicles, whether it's the Mercedes, the Audi, the Porsche, they have their share of gremlins after five years. And I am the kind of person that would want to own this more than five years. So my hope is the 48 volt electrical system will be a bridge to making these types of vehicles more reliable. And for the avoidance of doubt, I'm looking for the whole car, not just the suspension system. And that would be the entirety of my wish list. Feel free to opine in the comments below of anything else we should add to the wish list or via our social media, Motoman TV, all one word, Motoman TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I do want to stop here and share something rather important. If you haven't noticed, today is December 19th, which means next week is Christmas already, which means we are going to take our traditional Christmas and New Year break. So that would mean this is the season finale of season 11. I can't believe we're talking season 11 already. And that is quite a way to end the season. Now I do come to you guys at the end of December and I am thankful every December that you share this journey with us for the past 10, now 11 seasons. But this year I am more thankful for two reasons. The first is the obvious. This has been one hell of a year for all of us. And then number two, as many of you know, uh, we had quite an interruption at the beginning of season 11, and you guys got to meet some amazing people that stepped up to keep this show going, and you guys stepped up to support those people who were supporting me, and then you guys were there as I started to ramp back up into my role as hosting the show. Now granted, it's still, a slow, long recovery. I'm still doing PT every day. I've picked up paddle boarding to augment the slower running I'm doing at this point because I'm not quite back to running. But as challenging as those things are, what drives me is how incredibly supportive you guys have been. Like even just yesterday, somebody on one, I think it was the VW ID4 or the Porsche Panamera episode, left a comment saying, hey man, thank you for what you did this year and the attitude that you brought in your continued recovery. And it's that kind of support. I can't thank you guys enough for how you have been instrumental in getting me back in front of this camera. So until I see you on what, January 4th is when we will kick off our season 12 already. And we got some great cars lined up for January and February, I can tell you that. I will say, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Festivus for the rest of us, and very much looking forward to sharing 2021 and beyond with you guys. Bis später.